it happened. The unthinkable, the shift that showed our frailty. Nonetheless, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. We are separated. We are isolated. And in this world, we have trouble. Nonetheless, we take heart because Jesus has overcome the world. We are conflicted and frustrated, weary too. But nonetheless, those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. We are down but not out, sidelined but still in the game. We fight for our families, we hold on to love, we strive for kindness, but the hard times get harder. Nonetheless, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. We walk through adversity. We are sons and daughters of the Most High. We know to whom we belong and we know where our hope lies. For he is the first and the last the Alpha and Omega, the one who is and the one who is to come. It looks bleak, they say it's grim, there's a lot to fear, but nonetheless, we are strong. We are courageous. We are the church. Good morning, church. Welcome to worship. Will you just join us in singing out some praise to God this morning? He is good. Can I get an amen in your living room, wherever you are today?
Make some noise back there, bro. Ready? One, two, three. Woohoo! That selfie will be on the on the show next week. <laughs> yeah. So get your selfie, all right? Um, hope you're having a great day today. Uh, it's been a really good week. Some some cool weather and some crazy weather, right? So a little bit of everything. One thing that's probably on everybody's mind as we think about uh, what you hear in the news and all those things is that churches can open, to, you know, today. But if you, when you read the fine print, that's not really true. So we won't be holding service at the building probably till mid-June. Of course, there's a lot of variables there. So just so you kind of know what's going on there, we'll keep you updated on those kind of things. The other thing is uh, a lot of you back, boy, a long time ago. When was this, Nathan? February. November? February, February. February? Was it February? Got one of these cards to hang on your refrigerator. This came off of my refrigerator. Do you have yours still? It says 10... Uh, 10 Mile Community Church Sewer Project Prayer Pledge Card. And I know a lot of you have been praying, and I just want to in- encourage you to continue to pray. If we look at what's on there, oh, out of breath, that selfie got me. <laughs> <laughs> I pledge to pray every day. I hope that we are all praying every day. And, and let's look at this real quick. God would provide the funds to pay for this project. I'm going to update you on that in just a second. The project starts on time and runs smoothly. Well, there were a lot of delays but it was amazing how God worked us through so many issues and all kinds of easements and those kind of things. And uh, just thank you to all the guys that were really working on that and had a great lawyer that was helping us with that. So uh, praise the Lord. He, he answered those prayers. God uses TMC to minister to all those working on the project. And man, those, the guys that were around here working on that project were awesome. They're not here anymore because the project's done, if you haven't heard that. So uh, I think God's really answered in that in that way. And then it says, God, show me, God shows me how I can help with this project. And many of you have already responded to God's prompting, and, and a lot of us are still wrestling with maybe exactly what God wants us to do. And um, some of you have been prompted by God several times, and you've engaged not just with prayer, but also with finances. And I just want to say thank you for that. So if we go back to that beginning, God would provide the funds to pay for this project. Let me give you a little update on this project. So the, the work is almost totally completed. There's, there's still hydro seeding to do and one little connection from the parsonage. So there's a few little details. But um, the bill to be paid really is $160,000 right now. We had a $200,000 budget. And right now we have $125,000 in the bank. So that means we need $35,000 to remain debt free. And that, that's coming here this month when we need to pay that in full. So uh, we, we really need to be praying about that. So if you, if you think back to when we first talked about this card, in the first week we raised $35,000. So the question is, can we do it again? Can we raise $35,000 in a week or two? We've got about two weeks to do that, and then we would be completely debt-free, and we can move on to the other things that God is calling us to do and, and really be about ministry as usual and, and those kind of things. So please be praying with us uh, continually about that. And it's exciting to see that God's provided in so many ways through all of you and through some other means too, and that's just amazing. So I want you to keep that in mind. I want to encourage you to keep connected. Find ways to keep connected. Sherry and I kind of horned in on a life group that's been driving around doing, uh, doing encouragement drive-bys for people who can't get out, and it was so much fun. So if you could organize one of those yourself, pick up the phone and call a couple people every couple days and, and really connect. And, think, and just I've been praying and saying, God, prompt me on who I need to call, and it's been really cool to see the names that come to, to my mind and people that God's wanting me to call. So keep that in mind. And then I just want to go back and review for this whole thing about when can we get back together. Uh, we're, we're really going to be aligning. Idaho has stages one through four. We're going to be aligning with stage two, which means we'll start encouraging smaller groups to meet at that point. So during Idaho stage two, and then aligning with stage four. Of course, again, that's tentative, but in mid-June, stage four says we can meet together as a church, but there's going to be a lot of things that have to happen before that, and it'll still look a lot different because we have to do all the social distancing and things. So we'll keep you updated on that, but just keep in mind, not meeting at the church right now, okay? Thanks. Let's, uh, let's just go to the Lord in prayer as we continue to cover the sewer project in prayer. We continue to cover our church family as as we are separated more than usual right now, 
Um, and I want to challenge you as, as we pray, if God brings someone to mind, um, pray for them, pray for God's peace, but then I would challenge you to take another step and reach out to them some way. So as we're praying, if God brings someone to mind, either a family member, or a friend, a neighbor, a coworker, that just God says, Johnny or Teresa or whoever that person is, take a step, pray for them, and then also reach out to them. Let's pray. God, as we come before you in worship, we want to recognize that, that you are sovereign. You are, you're in control. And it's sometimes hard for us to wrap our minds around that. Um, there's a lot of big questions that come with that. But we have to leave that in the mystery of your will. But you, you've said in your word that you are in control and that you are sovereign and, 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 and you're over all things. And all things are held together through Christ. And so we know that you have a purpose. You have a purpose in all these things. You have a purpose in this sewer project that, that we're now almost completed with. And we just thank you for how you have led us every single step of the way. And so God, I pray in faith that we will see that $35,000 come in this next week. God, uh, just prompt hearts with a number that, is a faith number of, wow, really? Can I do that, God? But as your people say yes to that, we know that that's how you work. That's how you move. You prompt each and every one of us individually. And then the collective effort comes through. And so I just pray for that. God, bring to mind right now a couple names of people who are hurting, who need that, that personal touch in this season. God, give us the courage to step out and to reach out, whether that's picking up a phone and calling or a text message or putting a care package together, whatever that means, we know you're gonna prompt us. Uh, give us the courage to take that step. And last but not least, God, as we enter into this time of worship, I pray that we would find everything in you in this next hour all we are and all we need is found in you because in your presence there is freedom where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom so I pray that you would just send your spirit into our hearts into our living rooms into our cars wherever we're at that we would feel his presence and we would hear his whisper as uh, we hear your word today. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome? I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. There's a place 
for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me. a truth straight from the scripture. Jesus said, you know, he said, I'm going to go, but I'm going to go and prepare a place for you and for me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I'm going and preparing a place for you. See, in our father's house, there's a place for each one of us. We can belong because we're all his children, we're all a part of his family and there's a place for each and every one of us. There's no hierarchy of some are better and some are, are less in God's kingdom because we're all, we're all his children. And he's taken our fleshly heart and given us a, a new spiritual heart and a new identity with that. It's his identity. It's how he interacts and relates with one another. And it's so different from relationships in the world. It's amazing. And we're going to learn about that more. But that's part of the greatness of our God is his humility. That, that he comes as a little baby. He shows his greatness in the vulnerability that he has. And it's even the breath in our lungs, the air that we breathe, that he has given to us, that allows us to, to live and to work and to play and to interact. This is all just a great gift. So let's just praise him for this great gift of even the air that we breathe that's in our lungs this morning. You give life. You are love, you bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. You give life, you give life. You are love, you bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lives. darkness you 
Meditate on that verse. You give life. If you place your hand on your heart, you're going to feel a heartbeat. And think about it. You don't keep that heart beating, and it just keeps beating. Can you just praise God for the life that he's given you? And then wherever you are, if you can find a window... If you're in a living room, if you're in a car, look out your window and look at all of the green that's coming up. We had that huge rainstorm and some of us almost got blown away by it. But out of that refreshing rain, God uses that, he coordinates that to bring life and new growth and new plants and seeds. Just thank him and praise him for the new life that's all around us. Now, if you're with someone, I want you to look at them and look them in the eyes. If you're by yourself, pull out a picture on your phone of someone that you love and look at them and Feel the love that you have for them. That's from God. Thank him for the love that he puts in our hearts. Here's the reality is that all of us have darkness in our life. We have darkness of, of sin, of, of just mistakes that we've made, things that we regret. Maybe it's we wish we spent more time with our family and our kids. Maybe it's we wish we would have completed that project. Maybe it's we wish that we would have said some things to a loved one before they passed. But here's the hope is that God brings light to that darkness when we offer that to him. We say, God, I can't hold on to this anymore. I need to let go. I want to invite you to do that right now. Whatever that thing is, that darkness in your heart, that regret that you have, just name it. Just name it. Maybe just mutter it under your breath. Just whisper it and give it to God and say, God, I can't hold on to this anymore. I want you to bring light to my darkness this morning. Do you feel that, that feeling of hope that comes when we just surrender our, our darkness to God and let his light and his love come in? See, he gives hope and then he not only gives hope, but he restores. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us. See, it's not just a taking away, but it's a full restoration back to being children of God. It's how we look at our children if we have children. We just see them full of life and love and a future. And that's how he sees you. So let's sing this next part of this song from that place of forgiveness and restoration. God's gonna restore everything that's being taken away right now. 
even the earth is gonna shout his praise. The, the scripture says the rocks are gonna cry out. So let's sing this. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you. Shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. There you go. Anniversary picture. Mm -hmm. 23 years. Mm-hmm. Ah, I love my wife. Oh. I mean, she is the center of my universe. Well, I guess God is the center of my universe, but she'd be more like Mercury. I'm really not good with geography. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hear me, world. I am blessed, and I love this lady. I love her, I love her, I love her, I love her. She has more character in her pinky than I do my whole body. And I've been told I'm a character. Uh-huh. She's seen my feet. Oh? And she still loves me. My mom still makes me wear socks when I go into her house. Even in the summer, flip-flop season, socks. <laughs> and she gets more and more beautiful year after year. And I know it's not about the outside. Because her heart, oh, it's amazing. She still makes me laugh. <laughs> still takes my breath away. And at the end of the day, she's the one I want to see. Yeah. She's my person. I love her. Have you told her? Hmm? Have you told her all of that? Have you not been listening to what I've said? So you haven't told her? She knows. How? I asked her to marry me, didn't I? This speaks louder than words. What a lucky lady she is. <laughs> Tell me about it. It's possible you haven't told her. <laughs> it might be possible you haven't told him. It's possible that we need to work on uh, some things in marriage. And, or maybe if you think you're going to get married one day, it would be good to actually think through some things that you might need to work on in yourself 
so that you could be a good spouse, so that you could actually walk as God has designed us to walk when we unite in marriage. Of course, there are those other people that might be like Paul said, that it's just kind of better not to get married. And today, I think what you'll find as we look through Ephesians 5, starting with verse 21 and on through the end of the chapter, that there's some transferable principles that really relate here for even people who choose not to get married that really how to interact with other people in relationship. And that foundational thing is that God has called us to serve one another to, as we ended last week, we, were, we ended on that verse of submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And, and that's true in, in all of our relationships with brothers and sisters in Christ. And humility is so important as we interact with others. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to actually zoom out and recognize that marriage is simply a picture within a bigger landscape of God and relationship. And like I said, we're going to do that through this last part of Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to look at it as seen through marriage, yes, through that, that institution that God gave us clear in the beginning, but how it relates also just in, in all relationships. So let's Let's turn to Ephesians 5, starting with verse 21, and just read this, get it into our our minds as we get started today. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Have you told her? Husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, And let the wife see that she respects her husband. As we enter into this passage, I just want to recognize that it's actually complicated, I think, by two major factors. Uh, The first being misinterpretation through years and in different situations, and which in turn has led to a lot of abuses of, of things that really aren't in this passage. And so it's important for us to just kind of say that up front, that we need to come to this with more of a kind of clear our minds and, and look at what God's trying to tell us through this passage about relationship. It means really that some of us have a lot to overcome because of baggage in, the, in our past and things that we've been told or, or misunderstandings that are there. And I want to just go back to what we were talking about last week and using the picture of the Trinity as, as that foundation of the beginning of this chapter says, be imitators of God. And so we, we wound up with the Trinity and what that means and, and how that relates to being an imitator. We're imitating the Trinity. So let's, let's use that same picture and think about what submission to one another looks like Can kind of continue that, that uh, conversation a little bit. And so we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's the Trinity, those three as one. And you probably, a lot of you might have seen this diagram before. I just want to share it with you again, that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. We find that to be true as we read through Scripture in so many ways that that God clarifies this fact. But the unique thing about God that is, is kind of one of those mysteries it's hard for us to understand is that the Son, the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father. So what we see when we look at this picture is that 
It's a picture of oneness, of unity, but yet it is also a picture of different roles, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit play different roles in this oneness of God. And so we plant that in our minds. Let me review a little bit some of the verses that we already used and and one extra one here uh, to, to look at these roles. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me for I came from God and I am here. I am not of my own accord, but he sent me. You get that thing there at the last, it says, but he sent me, which tells us that the father exercised his authority over the son. He sent him into this plan, into his role as the son, the, the God in the flesh here on earth. And so we see that. And then if we look at the end of the verse that we looked at last week, John five nineteen, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord. And Jesus is saying, I, I only do what I hear the father saying. And, and here we have, he, he does nothing of his own accord, which shows Jesus' submission to his father. I only do what the father's doing. I only do what, what he tells me. And, and uh, so he's in submission. So it shows the role of the son in relation to the father. And then finally, we get to the Holy Spirit. And we looked at last week, he, the Holy Spirit, will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. Jesus is talking about, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit and he's going to to tell you the things that you need to know. And and here he says, he will not speak on his own authority. So while the Holy Spirit is God, he is very different from the Father or the Son. He has a completely different role. He submits to the Father and and the Son because Jesus in this verse later on, he says, whatever is mine is his. He, so the Holy Spirit submits to the Father and the Son, and then he directs us. In our spirits, the Holy Spirit directs us. All believers are given a status through their relationship with Christ. And so as we think about this whole diagram of the oneness of God and also the roles of God, well, the first place we need to think about is that all believers, through our relationship with Christ, have a oneness. We are one. And that's something that I think has been really misunderstood and and misstated often. Here in Galatians, where Paul is talking about the freedom that we have in Christ, that we have been set free from the law and that we are free to walk and to be who God created us, he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or and female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We're all one. Here's that idea of oneness. I believe that this speaks about equality, an equality that has been ignored in the church for, for a long time, actually, uh, through, through just generations and generations and generations, where this equality between races, between slave and free, between male and female, we are all created by God. And and in that, we are equal. We, like the Trinity, we may function in different roles. And actually, if you think about your own life, and if you think about the lives of other people, sometimes we function in multiple roles, two, three, even four different roles that we will find ourselves in in life. But as person to person, we are equals. And so we think about that. John Brown says, in life, there's always someone in authority over us. And often there is someone whom we are in authority over. God's chain of command, if you will. God definitely, when you read through scripture, he has a chain of command that he has, has a template for us and he has a purpose for that. And sometimes we might kind of struggle with God's chain of command, but that doesn't change God's point of view as he, as he shares it in scripture. The problem I think often comes that the reason we shy away from what God's chain of command is, is because it's different than our culture and we're not actually understanding all the nuances of it. And hopefully today, I'll at least cause you to think about that on your own in some different ways as I share some different perspectives. But you think about a student. A student has many people, many people who are in authority over them. 
God's in authority over them. His parents are in authority over them. Teachers are in authority over them. If they're in a sport, a coach is in authority over them. The government is in authority over a student. There, when, you, when you're a student, you kind of realize, it seems like everybody's in authority over me. And there's very few places that you might have authority. You might, maybe if you're a babysitter, you have authority over the kid that you're watching for that night. Or maybe if you're in some kind of a club at school or that kind of thing, you might have a place of authority because you might hold a position in that club. So you might in that way have authority. But as adults, we also play many roles, don't we? And we, like this quote from John Brown, we, we have this kind of thing. We can find ourselves as we're a spouse, we're a parent, we're an employee, we're a boss, we're a school board member, we're a church leader, we're a citizen. At times we are in authority over someone else our, and our charge is to guide and train and lead. But other times we're to follow and we find ourselves in that role. And so, we all, and you just think about your own life, where, where are you actually leading and where are you following? Because you have different roles. And it's important for us to recognize the role that we're in in different situations. In Romans 12, three through four, we get a little more perspective. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. That's, that's where everything has to start. This is humility. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think because we all should be really humble before God and, and serving other people. Our, our number one goal really should be to be like Jesus was when he was here on the earth, to serve others. He came to serve. He came to save. And that's the attitude that we should have. And then it says, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, we may have many members. Isn't that true? Just even in your own body, you think about a human body that God uses in his word oftentimes that in our, in our bodies, we have all these different, our hand doesn't do the same thing as our foot does. Our eyes don't do the same thing that our ears do. But it's pretty important to have all those parts. And they all are equal parts of the body, but they have different roles and different functions. And then he, so he finishes it. He says, for as in one body, we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. Function and equality are not the same thing. The members do not all have the same function. We need to think about that in our lives in so many different ways. Our lives in marriage, as this example in Ephesians 5, our, our lives in our, in our larger family, the family of our family of origin and the family maybe we're in right now, the, the church family, what, what function are we supposed to be playing in the church function? And then what about in the city that you live or maybe your subdivision and then in your state and in your government and all those kind of things, we think about what is our function? So our function, though, is not speaking about equality. Person to person, we are still equal parts. God's, God's created each one of us, and, and if we just look at it, we're all sons and daughters. Sons and daughters are equal. They're, you know, I think about my son and daughter, and I love them in amazing ways. I appreciate the differences between my son and daughter and their talents and their giftedness and all those things. But as my offspring, they're equal. I love them. They're amazing. And that's the way God looks at us. I think the world is struggling with this word submit because of years of abuse, uh, both from this passage in Ephesians and some other places in scripture where people use things and kind of manipulated it for their own purpose to be able to have power over other people. But that's not what God's intent is here. I, I don't believe at all. So equality is not equal to roles. Male and female are equal. They might serve different roles. And I don't know about you, I can tell you that I greatly appreciate that my wife is designed differently than me. We are different, we are equal, but we are different. And I, I sometimes have to chuckle when people say that males and females aren't different. That's just kind of humorous to me because it's so evident when you watch men and women and how they act and think and all those kind of things. And, and there's a beautiful difference between the genders. 
but they're still equal as people, as sons and daughters. We're still equal. You, you think about it this way. Let's think about equality in roles. Just because you're operating in a role as an employee does not mean you're not equal to the person you report to. As a person, you're equal to them. But it does mean that in the business you work, they have authority over you. They're your boss. So you just have different roles that you're playing. Why? To achieve probably a common purpose, whatever your job is about, whatever your business is about. But you're functioning in different roles to work together to achieve that purpose. And so I think that's, that's a good way of looking at it. That old saying, when we think about equality and roles, uh, is everybody puts their pants on the same way, right? One leg at a time. And that's, that's just like a get, get, get down to the grassroots of it that we all have two legs and if we're going to wear pants, we're going to put them on the same way. I mean, we're all equal. We're human. We are all human. Male, female, rich, poor, weak, strong, leader, citizen, all of those labels, if you think back through history, all of those labels have been abused at some point to declare inequality but it's, it's not a true declaration. People that have used those things to declare an inequality, they're, they're not speaking truth. Because when you get down to the basics of humanity, we are all the same. In, in uh, Ecclesiastes, Solomon says, apart from God, who can eat and who can have enjoyment? When you read through Ecclesiastes, he just puts everything kind of in, he, you know, I, put, I tried work and I tried, I tried just, doing joyful things, and I tried studying, and all these kind of things, and then he comes down, apart from God, who can do anything? You can't even eat apart from God. If it wasn't for him and him watching over us, we, we couldn't do anything. We are equal. We're God's children under him. No matter the label, we are fundamentally the same. Let's look here for a minute about uh, at the example of Jesus and the church that we find here in verses 23 through 27. Let's refresh that in our mind really quickly. For the husband is the head of the wife, even, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, be thinking about Christ and the church here. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives. How should husbands love their wives? As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. That is, if you think about it, that's quite a challenge. But let's just look really quickly. Jesus loves and sacrificed himself for the church. That is some kind of love to die so that his people could be sanctified and made holy. That is an, an amazing example of love. And so the, how does the church respond? The church responds by submitting and honoring Jesus. We submit to Jesus and his guidance in our lives and his purposes for our lives. We can all have our, we might think that we have our purpose for our life and we're going to go do this and that. But what if that doesn't line up with Jesus? You know, when, when we are God's children, we're part of the church, then we submit to Jesus and what he wants us to do and his will. And we follow God's will for our life. This is such a beautiful picture of Different roles, right? It's, it's and you know, later on, he, um, Paul calls it a mystery. It's a profound mystery of how Christ and the church is pictured in marriage. And, but it's a beautiful place to start that Jesus loves and the church submits and honors. So when we put this all together, we find two foundational principles in how we interact when we enter into marriage. So let's just kind of, I just want to stir your thoughts about these um, as, we, as we sit and think through the Trinity and we think about Jesus and the church and those kind of things. So there's some foundational principles. The first one is the husband is not the wife. Just thought I should throw that out there. The husband is not the wife. And that also means that the wife is not the husband. They're, they're different. 
Just like we saw in the Trinity example in that diagram that the Father's not the Son and the Son's not the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's not the Father, right? So we're still using that same template here, okay? But what we do find in verse 31, it says, therefore a man shall leave his father and, and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall what? Become one flesh. So the husband is one flesh through marriage with his wife and the wife is one flesh through marriage with her husband. And I think that's the biggest piece that a lot of marriages have gotten all messed up. They've forgotten about this one verse. A man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Have you figured that part out yet? That is a profound mystery. One flesh. Oftentimes people, I think, we just think about that as, oh, you get married and then you have physical intimacy and that's what one flesh means. No, it goes way past that. It is that, but that's just a representation of something much deeper, much more important, one flesh. Do you remember that Trinity example again? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they're not these things, but they are God. And remember last week we talked about that God has that those three have this incredible unity, oneness. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and they come together and they are God, one, in, a, in this crazy picture that's mind-blowing to us. And I think that the second mind-blowing picture that we have is that a husband and a wife are one. Do you... Do you see husbands and wives acting like one in our culture? If you're married, are you acting as one in that relationship? That's a huge challenge. Anyone who says that that's not a huge challenge is lying to you. <laughs> it is a huge challenge because I go back to what I said that I'm sure a lot of people will disagree with that men and women are different. Sorry, I think men and women are different. And when God says that they become one in marriage, that is a huge challenge to bring two different thought processes together and make it one. But in this, is this beautiful challenge is a great opportunity to proclaim Christ to the world. And I think that's part of what's being said here is that in marriage, we can demonstrate what true love really is. The second thing is that we see here that other relationship, the husband loves and sacrifices for the wife. Do you remember that in, as we read through that? Christ, Christ that it says, love, husbands, love your wife like Christ loved the church. That is a tall order. And I would challenge everyone who either is a husband or aspires to one day be a husband, you better work on what, it, what true love is because it's not falling in love. True love is a commitment. Christ made a commitment that he was going to save the world and he was going to save the church out of the world. And he was committed to it and he followed through with it even when the people he went to save persecuted him, made fun of him, didn't appreciate him, didn't recognize him for who he was, did his love stop? No, it didn't stop. He continued to love and he continued to do what he set out to do. And when you get married, it's a picture of it doesn't matter what your wife's doing, it's that you love her in a way that she cannot deny in a way, you know, this video that we started with, and he says, yeah, all these things, and he, have you told her? Well, I, I gave her one of these, didn't I? Right? And, okay, that's great, but how does your wife know that you love her? Beyond buying flowers when you're in trouble and those kind of things. Does she know every day that you love her? And then you think about the wife. The wife, when, you, when she's loved that way, it's pretty easy to submit in respect to the husband. And I know that that word submit is just like this 
bomb that goes off in our culture. But I would just challenge you, it's really not my job to convince you, it's, I would just challenge you to read through Scripture and continue to wrestle with that and go, uh, maybe there's a way to look at that that I've not thought of. Um, I, hopefully, these, these pictures are helping everyone realize. Because remember, in the center of this picture is one flesh, one flesh. And in here it says that um, where, I can't find it, um, that husband loves your wives of their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. That's a picture of the oneness. And if a, if a husband's loving his wife in that way, then this whole respect and honor thing on the other side, the wife respects and honors her husband is easy really, because there's oneness and you're going in the same direction. You're living the same life. I, out of this example, we learn that God's idea of marriage is something deep and profound. I, I alluded to that before. He says, you know, he says it's a, mi- a mystery. This mystery is profound. It is something we wrestle with and work on. And, and really, we find that marriage is an ever-changing thing. It's, if, it's always growing and it always takes work. Anything that's going to grow, it takes investment. You can't just go, oh, we got to figure it figured out. A lot of times when you're young, do you remember some of you out there that are young or maybe you are re- young right now and you go, oh, our relationship's so easy. You know, Tim Hawkins always goes, we're connected at the soul. It's just so great. You know, couples come to, for premarital counseling and they're just, they're always holding hands and they're connected at the soul and all those kind of things. And then they get married and it's a whole different story. <laughs> um, it's, it's a growth process, and we just need to realize that at the beginning. You, you might know each other really well if you're dating right now or you're engaged or, or early in your marriage, but I, I just want to encourage you, you're going to know each other more and more and more, and you should. And if you stop knowing each other more and more and more and learning together also, there's a problem because this whole dynamic of marriage, it's not like, you get to be 35 and you've got it figured out. Or you've been married 10 years and, and it's all good. You know, you got past the three-year mark and the seven-year mark, and so we're good. It doesn't work that way. If you do it, if you think that way, then, you know, we got past seven-year itch thing and we're good, then by about 10 years, it's going to fall apart because you always have to work on your relationship. You always have to pour into it. Let's look at a comparison. We did this with... Uh, when we were looking at identity, the world's way and God's way. So let's look at marriage in that way. So the world's way is a contract. And last time I checked, contracts in most, most government situations are, are something you can break. And, uh, and they get broken all the time because there's fine print somewhere. Well, in God's way, it's a covenant and there is no fine print. There's no fine print in husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Jesus is never going to check out of the church. He's never going to disengage from loving the church. You know, they're just too ornery. They're too messed up. And so I'm just done with them. I'm going to go create another world and start over. Jesus is never going to do that. And I guess that's just a simple way of kind of saying what a covenant is. A covenant is I'm all in. It doesn't matter what you do. I'm in. I'm going to love you no matter what. Right? And I can tell you that I've experienced that in my marriage because I've been sick and worthless for months and months and months. And my wife has picked up and done everything. She told me, because we, we use Samaritan's Ministries as a health, health thing. Well, Samaritan's Ministries is amazing, but it also means you have to do a lot of the work that insurance agents do. And at the very beginning, Sherry told me, she said, you concentrate on getting better. I will take care of, the, of all of those bills and and." posting them and tracking them and all the stuff, because it's a lot of work. And she's had other people help her. But anytime I go, oh, I should help you with that, she goes, no, that's not the deal. You just get better, you get healthy, and I'll take care of this. We're doing this together. That's an example. And I, and I can't even say strongly enough what a huge sacrifice that is, what an amazing demonstration of love that my wife has had towards me. Because it's not easy watching over someone who can barely make it from the bed to the couch and back to the bed sometimes and can't function and can't think very straight and all those kind of things. That's not an easy thing. But she's amazing. And it's a great picture of covenant marriage. 
I couldn't give, but she continued to give. That's covenant marriage. Um, as you look at the world's way, it's two people. But God's way, yeah, it's two people, remember? It's, it, they're a husband and they're a wife, but they're one flesh. And the world doesn't get that. The world just doesn't get it. It's two people. I'm myself, and I decided I would, like, live in the same space as you. That's not one flesh living. It's the world's way is tit for tat. It's that social equity thing. Well, you do these jobs, and I'll do these jobs, and as long as you do those, I'll be happy. But if you don't, I won't be happy. That kind of thing. It's, a, it's, it's social economics kind of union together. And that's not God's example. God's example is unconditional love, the one that I just talked to you about with covenant marriage and Sherry. And, and are you in that place? If you're thinking about you want to get married one day, you better think really hard on whether you can unconditionally love someone else. Or are you getting married for what you can get from it? And it's just so ingrained in our culture. You've got to think long and hard about that. The other one, this one's a little interesting in marriage counseling. We talk about this a lot. I'll ask people, so what's marriage? And a lot of times we come up with a 50-50. And I know that the heart of that is right. If, uh, well, it's 50-50, you know, we're both in this. But a long time ago, and I don't even remember who told me, they said, no, marriage is 100-100. And I know this is a little bit of a play on words, and it's probably not the intent most people think, but I think it clarifies something that needs to be clarified, that you're not 50% in. You're all in. One flesh. You are all in without anything held back. You are all in. 100, 100 is really the way to think about it. Uh, like I said, it's not that 50, 50, I think the heart is there, but I don't think it really has the punch that thinking about marriage as 100, 100 does. And then the world's way is I'm going to stick up for myself in this relationship. I got to make sure and protect myself. Well, is that one flesh? That doesn't sound like one flesh to me. If you feel like that you have to stick up for yourself in a relationship, that's the wrong person to marry. I, I, all you young people hearing me out there, if, if you're getting into relationships and you feel like you have to stick up for yourself, then check out of that relationship now because it's not headed in the right direction. And try, I've, I have sat with lots of teenagers that have made tons of excuses. Well, but he's a really nice guy and he just has this problem and I can help him and vice versa. And I'm just here to tell you that's not going to work because it's never going to get to that one flesh thing unless there's a huge heart change. In God's way, it's complementary roles. We understand that we, we function and we have different roles but we're one. And, and the interesting thing is, even in those roles, sometimes they, they bleed over, right? They, they bleed over and, and we realize that, um, oh, right now, kind of the example I gave with Sherry and I recently, but we've had that several times in our marriage where one of us was going through something difficult and the other one took up the difference. God strengthened the other one for the time that the one that was weak and struggling just couldn't do it. And that's, that's a picture of oneness. You flex and you work together and you understand the situation. And uh, it's not, I'm not telling you that that's an easy thing to do. It's not. When, when you're struggling, that's hard. And when your spouse is struggling, it's hard on you because you're one flesh. But you work together to overcome So I hope that looking at those pictures, really my goal today is to just give you some food for thought, some, some maybe inspiration to, to dig into God's word on your own and really think about your relationships and how you interact. And, and it doesn't matter if, if you're single and you plan on being single the rest of your life. I, I still think there's some great application here of, being in relationship, and in any relationship, there's give and take. In any relationship, there has to be like, what roles are you playing and, and how do you interact? And those of you that aspire to be married or you are married, 
I hope that this is a catalyst this week and next week to cause you to stop and think, am I really interacting? Am I relating the way God would really want me to? Am, am I continuing to grow in this relationship? Am I growing personally in that old, old example of a triangle that a husband and a wife and if you want to get closer to your husband or your wife, you grow closer to God because in a triangle, the closer you get to God, you're closer to the other one. And it's so important to grow close to God. Um, so as we think about next week, I hope we can think about how Ephesians applies to and counteracts all the sitcom jokes. I think about relationships in our culture and how whether it's a sitcom or a, a, a song that you're listening to, or you go to a wedding and all the jokes that happen with the bridesmaids and the groomsmen and all those things. And it's, it's just this subculture that is exactly opposite of what God wants us to have. And so hopefully we can, we can wrestle with those things together. God created this great union. He created it in the beginning. God created it. He he said, when he created the woman, and he said, it's not good for man to be alone. And he created Eve, and they came together. And, and Adam was pleased, right? And it was good. And they came together, and they were united together. God created this plan, and he wants us to live it out the way he planned it. Not by our rules, but by his rules. I'd like to close today as the, uh, the worship team kind of makes their way up, I'd, I'd like to close today just reading this. Sorry about that there, uh, Mr. Sound Guy. I messed up my microphone on you. I would like to close today by reading out of the message. It's, it's a paraphrase passage by Eugene Peterson. And uh, you can find it online if you want to read through it again. I, I hadn't turned to it for a long time, and then I turned to it for this just to get some perspective, and I just think there's some beautiful language. So as I read this, uh, just, just kind of listen uh, to the language that's used. Out of respect for Christ, be courteously reverent to one another. Wives, understand and support your husbands in ways that show your support for Christ. The husband provides leadership to his wife the way Christ does to his church, not by domineering, but by cherishing. So just as the church submits to Christ as he exercises such leadership, wives should likewise submit to their husbands. Husbands, go all out in your love for your wives, exactly as Christ did for the church. A love marked by giving, not getting. Christ's love makes the church whole. His words evoke her beauty. Everything he does and says is designed to bring the best out of her, dressing her in dazzling white silk, radiant with holiness. And that is how husbands ought to love their wives. They're really doing themselves a favor since they're already one in marriage. No one abuses his own body, does he? No, he feeds and pampers it. That's how Christ treats us, the church, since we are part of his body. And this is why a man leaves father and mother and cherishes his wife. No longer two, they become one flesh. This is a huge mystery, and I don't pretend to understand it all. What is clearest to me is the way Christ treats the church. And this provides a good picture of how each husband is to treat his wife, loving himself and loving her, and how each wife is to honor her husband. Let's pray. Father, help us to have a glimpse of understanding of this mystery. I pray, God, that you would help us to overcome um, maybe hurtful things that have been said from this passage in the, ba in the past and instead really, really understand and be committed and, and encouraged in this beautiful picture of marriage that you've given us. Lord, show us how to truly love, not fall in love, but truly love as you love. Lord, we need, we need your help to relate to each other well in humility. In Jesus' name we pray.
Let's respond in a song as we reflect on what it means to relate husband and wife, male and female. We think about how Christ loves his church and what he did for the church. He died for the church to bring each and every one of us from death to life. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not my failures I try to hide it was my doom till I met you you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glory God is good, he loves you, and he is rooting for you because you're his child, you're his kid.